Good morning, everyone. Time for another crypto update. So this is Bitcoin Wisdom's Bitfinex chart, and you can see here we're sitting at 7,300. Now, when I spoke with you last time, I was talking about the chances that we would get uh, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90% correction. Now, you can see on this chart here, the lines that I've drawn in, I, I pointed out that support was around 10,000, 8,000, 6,000, 4,000, and 2,000. That's still where it is. Uh, we're in the process of testing the 8,000 support. So you can see we've dipped below it here and we're testing this area. Uh, 10,000 clearly didn't hold and uh, that was obviously at this point, in hindsight, too early to buy. I have deployed personally uh, quite a bit of my firepower. Not all of it, but quite a bit of it. Uh, I was pretty sure there was going to be a bounce at 10,000, but I was holding out the possibility that we would hit 8. Now again, there's a possibility we would hit 6, or 4, or 2. So, uh, what is this in the history of things? Well, let's look at... Um, the latest from Zero Hedge here. This is a Bitcoin bloodbath builds now amongst biggest crashes ever. I think what they mean is biggest crashes in Bitcoin ever. They give us this chart here, which is it's fairly accurate. It's not really good because it's on a I think it's on a linear scale. Oh, it's a log scale, so it doesn't really show you the how dramatic the moves were. But you can see that back in 2011, we had a 93% bear market. Now, I've said in the past that we've had multiple 90% bear markets. I believe that's correct, but I don't think that the early bear markets are on here, starting from Bitcoin at a penny. It looks like it shows Bitcoin starting at 10 cents. So I may be wrong. Anyway, according to this chart, we've already had four bear markets uh, exceeding 60%. And the first one in 2011, 93%. Now, 70% bear market, uh, we had one in 2013 and in 2014, and nearly one in 2015. And now, according to this, we're currently on a 62% bear market. So. It's pretty easy to do the math because conveniently we went to, I'm just going to call it 20,000, a round number. So obviously 10,000 is a 50% bear market, 8,060. 6,000 is a 70% bear market. 4,000 is an 80% bear market. And 2,000 would make a 90% bear market. So, um, where are we as far as the support lines? Well, the major trend line is going to be this one right here. Hopefully, if I can draw this in, it's kind of sticky. So the the major major trend line back from last year. Now that isn't the lowest one. I'll draw that in a second. That gives us a target of six thousand for the bottom of this thing coming up with support and with the trend line. The, the absolute lowest trend line starts all the way down here at about a thousand. I drew this one in last time and you can see it just touches there and that's going to point to that 4,000 price. So 6,000, I think that one's more likely than not at this point. 4,000, I would give that maybe a 30% chance of happening and I don't think we're going to get the 90% bear market this time. I really don't. Now, why is this all happening? Well, market's correct, for one thing. But also, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, FUD, but also direct attacks from basically everyone, which is, for me, is very encouraging. If you remember last time I talked about how the critics bounce back and forth between these two uh, contradictory positions. They, on the one hand, they say that, well, cryptocurrencies can never work. Uh, but then they immediately bounce to, but if they do, then governments will stop them. 
And if you remember last time I said that, no, they, they do work. We already know that they work. And I think the fact that they do work is proof that governments can't stop them. But nevertheless, governments are very interested in stopping them. And it's fairly obvious to anybody who looks at it with a, you know, an open mind that the reason why is because governments are running a gigantic Ponzi scheme. And they've got just about everybody involved. Now, if you remember, I've gone through videos before and I went reviewed my video that I did back in 2011 showing you the elements of a Ponzi scheme and how Bitcoin in no way fits the elements of a Ponzi scheme. But one of the elements that most people mean when they call something a Ponzi scheme is they mean this greater fool principle. That being that at some point any particular investment is going to run out of buyers simply because everybody's in. So for, for people to make the argument that everybody's in, and that's one of the reasons why cryptocurrencies are a, a Ponzi scheme, is, is just on its face absurd. Um, but let me show you a real Ponzi scheme. Now we had a close on the Dow Industrial Average uh, last market session on Friday, down 666 points. Now, I don't, I don't know if you remember, but the bottom in 2009 on the S&P 500, this is, again, this is, this is a Dow chart, but let's, let's pull up the S&P chart if we have it here. Here's the S&P 500. So if you remember, the bottom on the S&P 500 in 2009 was 666, right there. Was that a coincidence? I don't think so. Now we had a 666 point drop on the Dow. Are they signaling something? Perhaps. So we want to watch stock market action very, very carefully today. Let's put it back on the Dow. Also something very interesting to note is that the cryptocurrencies led not only the credit markets, but also the stock market down. So you can see here, let's zoom in here on the one minute chart. You can see that after hours, the futures took a significant plunge. But this morning around 6.30 a.m. we had a mysterious buyer. You can see that as the futures opened up, the market was collapsing, it was in a free fall. And that's to be expected, especially when you have the type of close that we had on Friday, which is a very bearish close on the lows sort of thing. And we had a mysterious buyer step in here at 6.30 a.m. You can see it ran the Dow from about 25,150 all the way up to 25,500. So uh, a good 400 plus move or for around 400 point or so move on the Dow. Now it kind of topped and we're filling in. It kind of almost tried to fill this markets tend to try to fill gap areas. This isn't technically a gap area, but because there was so thin trading during this time frame, it, it kind of is treated like a gap by the market. So you can see an attempt to fill, and then now, now we're in kind of a rolling over pattern here. So just by the looks of it here, it looks like we're probably going to go lower. Uh, it was that 666 point move, uh, down move, a, a signal by the powers that be to their buddies that it's time to get out, that the bottom that was formed at 666 on the S&P 500 is now over with a 666 point Dow drop, who knows. But the reason I'm bringing up this chart is to show you that this is the real Ponzi scheme. But this is the one they want you involved in. And the reason why they want you involved in this Ponzi scheme is because they can pull a plug at any time. They have complete control over the credit markets and the financial markets, the stock markets. 
but also the real estate market and just about every other market. In fact, the only markets that they don't have control of are true decentralized peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency markets. And that's why we're involved with them. Because if you're like me, you believe they're going to lose. Absolutely. They're going to lose. They're on the wrong side of history and they're going to fail. And that I'm talking about all the governments of the world are wrong. Now, this is the, as I point out, this is the real Ponzi scheme. This is the thing that everybody's in. Remember I said the greater fool principle, this, this one element of a Ponzi scheme that there's no one left to buy. Well, equity markets and bond markets, there for quite some time there has been nobody left to buy. Most of this buying that started, let me get my arrows, most of the buying that started right here in 2009, this was central bank buying of this market. And central banks have been buying this market all the way up ever since. Uh, we have the Swiss National Bank, one of the largest holders of U.S. stocks. That's insanity. So it's actually gone beyond the greater fool. It's... Uh, they've had to manufacture new fools to buy it and that's the central bank so this is the market that they want you in this is where they want you to sink all your money because this is this is money they can steal whether it's through taxes whether it's through confiscation whether it's through bankruptcy whether it's through a crash there's any number of ways when you're involved in this market or the bond market or any of the other markets they control that they can take all of your wealth and there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. The real, only real markets where you can protect yourself are the precious metals, and I've been talking about precious metals for over a decade, or the cryptocurrencies. Now the precious metal markets, silver specifically being the one that I cover the most, they've pretty much killed off. So you can see here Sitting in February of 2018, we're basically at the same price we were in February of 2017, which is a little bit higher than we were in February of 2016, but roughly the, the same price we were in February of 2015. Now we're a little bit lower than where we were in February of 2014, but we're very close to the same price uh, that we were in, say, May or June of 2013. So we're, we're coming up on an effective five-year period of nullification. And if you want to go back, you can go all the way back to 2008 and see that we're actually sitting at uh, the old high back there in 2008 or even near the top we reached in 2006. So almost 12 years of no prices in silver. Now, is physical silver a place where you can protect yourself from the schemes of these uh, governments and banksters that represent them? Absolutely. It's still a fantastic buy. Uh, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. If you hold it in your physical possession, then yes, you have effective protection against their Ponzi schemes whenever they decide to collapse them. Now, how big is this Ponzi scheme that they're running? Well, this is an older article. This is from spring of 2017. It's called The World's Money in Numbers. And at that time, I think it's larger now, but at that time, global financial assets were $300 trillion. Now, another criticism that you get from people who love to criticize cryptocurrencies is that they're ones and zeros. They're just digital entries. There's, they're, they're nothing. They're just computer entries. Well, I would estimate that probably 90%, 90 plus percent of this $300 trillion is precisely that. It's just a ledger entry in a computer. It's, it's not real wealth. 
it's just what a computer says exists and what a computer says can be changed by whoever programs it. But let's look at the breakdown of this. You can see that the M1 money supply, cash, different currencies is at 24 trillion. Bank deposits are at 50 trillion. Central bank balance sheets, 20 trillion. Now, keep in mind the crypto market cap. If you remember, I did an interview back in June of 2017 when the crypto market cap was roughly $100 billion and I predicted that it could go to a trillion dollars by the end of the year. It actually went to roughly $850 billion and, this, and then we had this uh, beginning of this correction. We're now down to $347 billion. So keep that number in your mind as we're looking at these other numbers. $347 billion, that is the total value of all cryptocurrencies in the world. Whereas $20 trillion alone is just the amount of money that central banks have on their balance sheets. Institutional assets under management, $100 trillion. Global equity, $64 trillion. I looked this one up. We're, we reached closer to $100 trillion on global equities. Mutual funds, $40 trillion. Okay, is that different? Uh, are bonds mixed in there? Who knows? I don't think anybody does. Pension funds, $34 trillion. These are people who are expecting to retire and have somebody else pay for their retirement. Yeah, they have investments, but like I said, it's a, it's a Ponzi scheme. Insurance companies, $26 trillion. Hedge funds have $3 trillion. Private capital, $4.5 trillion. Private equity, $2.5 trillion. Global real estate's worth $217 trillion. You want to talk about a bubble that's getting ready to pop? How about commercial real estate? The malls that nobody goes to anymore. $54 trillion. Gold comes in at a paltry $6.8 trillion. We really don't know how much gold is out there. What is silver? A tiny, tiny fraction of this figure. The gold to silver price ratio which is the price of gold divided by the price of silver, is, uh, has been for the longest time bouncing around 70 to 80 to 1. But what is the gold to silver uh, above ground ratio? In other words, the value of all silver above ground versus the value of all gold above ground? I would estimate it's, it's close to 1,000 to 1. There's probably a thousand times more dollars worth of gold above ground than there is silver above ground. Maybe it's not that extreme, but it's an extreme figure. It's much more extreme than the 80 to 1 uh, gold to silver price ratio. So silver is still an absolute uh, steal at these prices. Here's money holdings, individuals with $147 trillion. This is a big part of the money that governments really don't want flowing into cryptocurrencies. So you can see the, the individuals with less than a million dollars, there's a total of $147 trillion out there. Individuals with a million to a $30 million, there's $75 trillion out there. Individuals that have more than $30 million, there's $41 trillion that they have. So just imagine just these individuals, just these people who are worth more than $30 million, they have $41 trillion worth of wealth. What does $41 trillion do when it's tried to force into a, forced into a $347 billion market? That door is pretty small. So what's going on in the news? Well, uh, basically, the governments of the world uh, are trying to crush the cryptocurrencies. Now, we've got news coming out of China. You can see here, uh, Zero Hedge reports, after surging to $20,000 less than three weeks ago, Bitcoin tumbled below $8,000 again overnight following a report from Chinese media that China 
will block all websites related to cryptocurrency trading and initial coin offerings, including foreign platforms, in a bid to finally quash the market completely. Now, members remember I wasn't making my videos public back at that time, but when the China FUD started, I said that China is out to completely destroy cryptocurrencies. A lot of people disagree with me. A lot of people said that China just wants regulation. I said that balderdash, China is out to destroy cryptocurrencies. The reason I believe that China is out to destroy cryptocurrencies is because cryptocurrencies are out to destroy China's bid to become the world reserve currency. They believe it's their turn, I believe, that they believe that it's their turn, that the U.S. and the, the British, that their day in the sun is over and Europe is finally done and it's time for the emergence of the next world power, that world power they believe is going to be them and they believe that, I think they believe that they're going to issue either a gold back to one or some type of basket, but they they expect to be a major player going forward with the world reserve currency. But something has emerged, and that's cryptocurrencies, that none of them expected. So we see the governments of the world acting in unison. So think about the fact that we have the shills here, like, uh, let's look at, uh, for example, look at this person here. Defending the Chinese. You mean trying to protect their citizens from falling into the cryptocurrency Ponzi scheme is not capitalism. So here you have a person on Zero Hedge, supposedly somewhat of a free market financial site, defending the communist government for trying to destroy one of the only free market uh, only free markets in the world. That's how bizarre it is. So, as I've said, the Chinese have known for quite some time that cryptocurrencies have the potential to throw a wrench in their plans. And uh, I said that the first volley in, in that, in regard to cryptocurrencies in China, was, was the beginning of a crackdown where they're going to completely try to outlaw them. And I think I was right. It's this proves it. So we have pretty much all the governments of the world ganging up, trying to prevent people from getting their money out of their systems into cryptocurrencies. We also have Chase and now Bank of America passing rules that people who have credit cards cannot purchase cryptocurrencies with them. Some is talked about a $10 fee, others have talked about banning. I'm not sure what the actual uh, facts are on that story, but clearly we have the banks fighting against cryptocurrencies. We have the governments fighting against cryptocurrencies. We have the financial, we have everyone fighting against cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are kind of like Trump. Um, I, I remember predicting that Trump would win a year before the election. And one of the reasons I knew Trump was going to win was because everybody was against him. And when everybody, including the people in your own party, are against you, that tells you something. That tells you that people are very scared. They're very threatened. And they know the danger of a person who's an outsider getting in there. Well, the same is true of Bitcoin. Uh, and I'm, I, when I say Bitcoin, I mean cryptocurrencies. We're going to talk about the Bitcoin story here in a second here. And why I personally am no longer invested in Bitcoin per se. In other words, I really don't hold any of my cryptocurrency assets in Bitcoin, Bitcoin Core specifically. I'll get into in a minute what I've diversified into. But uh, the governments of the world, the banks of the world, basically everybody in the world is ganged up against cryptocurrencies and they're all going to lose. Just like a Ponzi scheme, uh, it's all going to go up in smoke and uh, the stock markets of the world, they're all going to go down together. You can see it when you pull up the DAX or the Nikkei or the NASDAQ, this is the NASDAQ or the 
FTSE or any of the markets, these markets all trade together because they're all propped up by their various central banks. Uh, they're all going to go down together. They're all going to crash together. They're all probably going to be shut down together and the money locked in or converted over to some type of worthless government bond. And all the lemmings and sheep are going to be trapped and sheared and run off a cliff and slaughtered. And that's what's going to happen. And that's why they don't want you in cryptocurrencies. They don't want you protecting yourself. Now, I, I mentioned that I'm going to get into this story about Bitcoin and why I'm no longer uh, investing directly in Bitcoin Core. Now, this is a story about Blockstream. If you haven't heard of Blockstream, Blockstream is an organization that controls now, at least in many people's opinion, most of the programmers and core developers. And for that reason, uh, people don't trust it. Now, let me uh, let me say as, uh, as an aside here that uh, a lot of people have coming, been coming down very hard on Roger Ver, and I've been listening to Jeff Berwick and others investigating Roger personally. Um, I have to say that somebody who personally spent time in prison for criticizing the ATF and basically left the country and renounced their citizenship, um, that's going to be a person I'm probably going to listen to more likely to be telling the truth. Now, I've watched recent interviews with Roger, and I think the arguments are very, very good that Bitcoin Cash is more of a true representative of Satoshi. I know people are gonna, people absolutely go off when I use the term Satoshi. Whoever Satoshi is, uh, if it makes you happy, Satoshi being a group of inside NSA cryptologists, okay? Cryptographers who decided to call themselves Satoshi. Whoever Satoshi is, the original white paper, the original roadmap was for bigger blocks. That has now been blocked by Blockstream. So I'm going to read a little bit of this so you can understand what's going on behind the scenes. It's called The Truth About Who's Behind Blockstream and Segwit. As the saying goes, follow the money. The too-big-to-fail insurance giant AXA is one of the main owners of Blockstream, and they're throwing around millions of dollars to any developer, troll, censor who opposes Satoshi's simple and safe roadmap for on-chain scaling, i.e. bigger blocks by a hard forking. But fortunately, we can route around Blockstream's censorship and centralization once Greater than 51% of the network uninstalls the Blockstream's crippled Bitcoin client, installs a Bitcoin client from Unlimited or Classic that accepts bigger blocks than the market and not some clueless developers at Blockstream paid by central bankers will again be fully in control of Bitcoin's block size, volume, and price. Blockstream is now controlled by the Bilderberg Group. Seriously. Access Strategic Ventures, co-lead investor for Blockstream's $55 million financing round, is the investment arm of the French insurance giant AXA Group, whose CEO, Henri de Castries, has been chairman of the Bilderberg Group since 2012. If Bitcoin becomes a major currency, then tens of trillions of dollars on the legacy ledger of fantasy fiat will evaporate destroying AXA, whose CEO is the head of the Bilderbergers. This is the real reason why AXA bought Blockstream to artificially suppress Bitcoin volume and price with a one meg with one megabyte blocks. Now, if you don't understand this briefly, what happened to Bitcoin is that the number of transactions is limited by this block size. And there aren't that many transactions that can go through per second compared to, for example, the Visa network or other things. Now, that's easily fixable. We know there's a ton of hashing power out there with the miners, but there's a limitation in the software. Now, it was originally the vision of Satoshi or whoever this ghost is that is called Satoshi that this would be raised. The reason why it wasn't raised initially was because they were afraid of a type of 51% attack forking it, etc. So they wanted to put a limit on that size, but the vision was to slowly raise that size as the, as the transaction volume increased. We know what happened 
Bitcoin started to become very, very expensive to transact in, and it became very, very slow to transact in. And that, as Jeff Berwick has pointed out, are two of the major purposes of a decentralized peer-to-peer cryptocurrency is to have low transaction costs and fast transaction times. If you take those two away, you've effectively uh, destroyed the cryptocurrency. The insurance company with the biggest exposure to the $1.2 quadrillion, i.e. $1,200 trillion derivatives casino is AXA. Yeah, that AXA, the company whose CEO is the head of the Bilderberg Group and whose venture capital arm bought out Bitcoin development by investing in Blockstream. Greg Maxwell used to have intelligent, nuanced opinions about Max block size until he started getting paid by AXA, whose CEO is head of the Bilderberg Group. I know I keep saying that, but you need to think about it. The legacy financial elite which Bitcoin aims to disintermediate. Greg always refuses to address this massive conflict of interest. Why? Who owns the world? Well, this person says it's Barclays, Axis, State Street Bank. I think it's more the Federal Reserve and other reserve banks. Now you can see this was written before Bitcoin went to 10,000. He says here, Bitcoin could go to 10,000 US dollars with four megabyte blocks, so it will go to 10,000 US dollars with four megabyte blocks. All the censorship and shilling on our Bitcoin and fantasy fiat from AXA can't stop that. Bitcoin Core might stall at 1,000 US dollars and one megabyte blocks, but Bitcoin will scale to 10,000 US dollars and four megabyte blocks and beyond. Very interesting. So this person predicted that we would get that 10,000 price. We did get that 10,000 price, and now 10,000 seems to be kind of a swing point, an access point for the market. So I was going to talk about uh, what I'm looking at investing in, scaling into. Let's get to the uh, close-up view here. You can see we're actually testing into the sixes. Uh, we got a low of 755. That's on Bitfinex. Bitstamp, 7,000 uh, even right there on Bitstamp. I always like to go over and look at Coinbase because that's actually, actually quoted in real US dollars. You can see Coinbase, we actually got a stamp of 69.60. So we actually got into the sixes. So like I said, six. 7,000 is a, uh, I'm sorry, 8,000 is a 60% uh, bear market. 6,000 is going to be a 70% bear market. So we're between 60 and 70% bear market. And uh, the interesting thing about all of this is that while we have the stock market just kind of starting to roll over, uh, the powers that be are kind of undecided. They don't really know whether they want to let this thing tank. Uh, that's kind of been the case for a long time. We thought that 2009 was going to be, or 2000, you know, the 2008 financial crisis, that was going to be it. They were going to sink the fiat system. That was going to be the end of it. But you can see that uh, they didn't allow that to happen. A lot of people thought the dot-com bubble was going to be the end of it, but uh, they've been printing money to prop these things up. At some point, they're going to pull the plug. They have complete control over when they pull the plug, and they're doing their darndest to make sure that everybody is in their system before they pull the plug. So you can see now we're rolling over, trying to test those uh, central bank intervention lows, uh, who's going to be stronger, who's going to have more resolve, uh, uh, people panicking out of stocks or the central banks coming in and buying stocks, we'll see. But uh, back to the story about cryptocurrencies, as I said, I don't have a lot of confidence in Bitcoin Core anymore simply because of the interference of Blockstream. Now, that being said, um, I am in the process of deploying the rest of my capital back into the market and my number one pick is going to be Litecoin. Now, let me explain to you why. I started getting the Litecoin as it was uh, 
or I started adding more Litecoin, I should say, I was already into Litecoin, but I started significantly adding more Litecoin as it got down near this $100 price. You can see it shows 110 on this chart, but it was, I think Litecoin actually traded below $100. We can uh, pull up Coinbase because that's going to be where you actually uh, buy it. So, pulling up the Litecoin chart on Coinbase, you can see this isn't out far enough. So, according to Coinbase, yeah, we had a print of 107, 103. This is where I was scaling into Litecoin. Now, let me explain to you why I picked Litecoin. One of the reasons I picked Litecoin is there well there's a number of reasons the first reason is because litecoin had already corrected a significant amount so let's pull up the litecoin chart here litecoin us dollar from bitfinex i like the pattern i especially like that litecoin has basically corrected back down to the breakout point so you can see that Litecoin has pretty much taken back the entire run from 100 to 370. And that's usually the extent of most bear markets. The other thing that I really like about Litecoin is that another thing I really like about Litecoin is the market cap is very, very low. Another thing I like about Litecoin is that it's been around almost as long as Bitcoin. Most of the coins have already been mined. I also like the fact that the transaction times are very fast and the transaction costs are very low. And the last thing I'll say is the reason I like Litecoin strictly is a technical reason. You can see here, if you look at these uh, graphs, let me zoom it in so you can see these. May not zoom in perfectly. But if you look at these graphs of all these cryptocurrencies, you can see Bitcoin going into new lows, Ethereum going into new lows, Ripple very close to going into new lows, Litecoin not really even close to going into new lows. You can see that. So Litecoin appears to be the first one that is turning. Uh, the other one that I like here is Stellar Lumens, uh, and that comes in at 5.71 billion. Now I've covered before the fact that almost all of these cryptocurrencies, and I'm talking about the decentralized ones, I'm not talking about Ripple, I'm not talking about Ethereum ones you can invest in, but you have to keep a close eye on because the central bankers, I believe, have their fingers in them. But the true decentralized cryptocurrencies, certainly Bitcoin, Core, Bitcoin Cash, and this is another one that I'm investing in a little bit because I think it is the real Bitcoin. Um, and then uh, a little bit in Stellar. You have to remember that these coins are very, very undervalued compared to what we have here in the world's uh, total balance sheet. So I believe that the cryptocurrencies that are going to bounce first or that are going to bounce best are going to bounce first. And I'm seeing that in regards to Litecoin. I'm seeing it a little bit in regards to Ripple, maybe a little bit in regards to Bitcoin Cash. The rest of them I'm pretty much staying away from. Again, this is not to give financial advice. I can't give financial advice. All I can do is tell you what I'm doing. So this is what I'm doing. And uh, we're gonna keep a close eye on the price here. 7,000 absolutely is a big price point. Uh, but we wanna keep a closer eye on that 6,000 point, $6,000 price, uh, 7,000, 6,000, anywhere in here uh, it's going to be the big test. I think uh, this point right here. So we're talking roughly 6,000 to 6,500. 
This is where I think we're going to test next. I think there's a high probability of a, a very large bounce. That's going to give back essentially the entire bull run from mid-November all the way through the end of the year when we hit that 20,000 price point. It's also going to be the completion of a 70% correction. 70% is a very significant correction. Uh, even in the past when we had 90% corrections, the reversion back to that 70% point was only a matter of days in many cases. So watching Litecoin very closely, want to see what it does uh, if we do break into the 6,000s. And uh, I am looking at uh, increasing my position size uh, going along uh, some of the alternatives and certainly not going back into this uh, true Ponzi scheme, which is uh, all of the world's central banks, all the world's governments, all the world's banks trying to prop up this Ponzi scheme. That's the one they want you involved in. And we'll talk to you next time.